Do you want to make a brain that looks like a real brain? Like, yeah. Four parts. In that case, you need to do two of everything. Because your brain has two parts. So you get to build it up from the inside out. So we start off, the very first step, it's like a little sausage. So it's this bit. And that controls your heartbeat and breathing. So your heart, ba bum ba bum And your breathing. Do you know, and it could be your brain that controls that. Do you know why your heart needs to beat, to beat more? Yeah, it, it has to pump your heart, your blood. Hmm. Do you know what's inside your blood that's important? Brains Oxygen. You know we need to breathe. Have you heard of oxygen? Keep squidging and squidging, or you can sort of twist and. We've got lots of it, so you can make it reasonable yeah. size. Lovely, so that's your brain step. Right, your second step is called your cerebellum. Yeah, so you're going to make one there, but then there's another there. So what you need to do is to make two little balls. Can you see? And the balls are going to go at the back, there and there. You can, it's almost like a little plaster to keep it on, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to turn the cars on so you can have a little practice. Okay, you ready? On your marks, get still, go. And purple is away. So what we're doing here today is called EEG biofeedback or neurofeedback. I'm measuring the electrical activity of this girl's brain. So this is her trace and that's her mother. And then we're filtering it into theta, low beta or high beta. What they need to do is make less theta and less high beta, but more of the attention brain waves of low beta. Then the cars will go. If they become sleepy and produce more theta, or become overexcited and produce more beta, high beta, then the cars will stop. So this is something called operant conditioning. Basically, when they get the good brain waves, the cars go, and when they don't, the cars stop. So they learn over time what it takes to make the, the cars go. In this setup, we can race two kids against each other, so it's all a bit of fun. But clinically, it's used for all sorts of conditions like ADHD, epilepsy, uh, dyslexia. It's also used for peak performance, so Chelsea and Milan football clubs are using it, a lot of the Canadian Olymp uh, Olympic team, and also business people for kind of more relaxation training or meditation training. What else can we look at? Uh, how, about, oh, how about some frog blood? Frog blood, yeah. So those are all the blood cells. So your blood, it looks like red liquid, doesn't it? We have a stand here from the Brain Bank, which is based at King's College London. We just wanted to show people some of the sorts of things we're doing at the Brain Bank, how we collect the brains and preserve them so that people can use them for their research. So we've got some images of, of some different brains and some of the techniques we can use the tissue for and we've got a few examples of the sorts of results and the different types of diseases that we might see in people that donate their tissue to us. How do I get that? So the next step, number three, is called the thalamus. You're making two balls that go on top. That's it, that's it, and another one. That's it. Yep. The next step is called the hippocampus, and it means seahorse-like. And this is to do with being able to form memories, to be able to learn. So it's going to be like a little smile, a little smile there, so it's to be able to remember things. That's it. Brilliant. Right. The next one, can either of you say that? It's such a hard word. 
What size? That's it, amygdala. It's actually where our feelings, our, our emotions are. So feeling sad and happy, it's all within your brain. It's been sort of a long-standing belief that individuals with autism have problems with face recognition. There's so many different co-occurring conditions like depression, uh, ADHD, dyspraxia, it's hard to work out what features of their condition are due to autism or due to these co-occurring conditions. So what my lab has done is look at a condition called alexithymia, which is really intriguing conditions. People with alexithymia like, feel emotion like we do. So they can say, oh, I'm feeling something, like I feel like this tingle, or I feel a certain way, but they struggle to verbalize it. So they can't say, oh, I'm feeling happy or I'm feeling sad. Now, if you imagine, if you struggle to do that, how can you then see someone else also feeling sad or also feeling happy? Get making lots of long wiggly wiggly sausages to do the surface of the brain. So you're going to get start on the side of the brain, and that's your language and hearing. The back will be your um, will be vision, so looking at things. Top to do with controlling your body, and the front your personality. But why would it be so wrinkly? It's wrinkly whatever your age. Any ideas? More wrinkly than other animals. It's because that's the clever bit of the brain. I'm an artist and I work at Tate and um, we were developing a project in relation to uh, animation, interpretation and uh, motion perception. We did um, a case study and um, focus groups to start selecting a few paintings. Uh, they usually were from historical artwork from Tate Britain and start thinking how we could um, animate and bring in those to life. So you like combinations of colors? Why do you like one color? You know, our way of perceiving artwork can actually connect to the way we perceive reality or we, we want to change reality. And so many times animation is actually a, an artistic methodology that allows um, to, to make uh, more abstract uh, ideas become reality. Mm -hmm.